If the clue is Jeopardy, my response in the form of a question, why is that show going downhill? I'm Larry Fedorik and this is Later That Same Life. On each episode of my weekly podcast, a different topic, discussion, or story from our lives. Season 14, Chapter 5, Jeopardy. First fun fact of this podcast, the Jeopardy announcer, the guy who says, This is Jeopardy! Introduces the contestants and then the host is Johnny Gilbert. This past summer, Johnny Gilbert turned 96. 96! Still going into the office every day. Bravo! He has been the show's announcer for 40 years. He is the voice of Jeopardy. And listen, I hope Johnny Gilbert lives to be 196. But since that's unlikely, I think this would be a proper use of AI. You AI Johnny's voice and keep him on Jeopardy through infinity. We continue to pay his estate or his heirs, but it would be a nice tribute. The second longest serving Jeopardy alumnus would of course be Alex Trebek, who hosted the show from its revival in 1984 right up to 2020. 37 seasons. Third longest would be Alex Trebek's mustache, who hosted for 17 seasons. Little known, the son of Alex Trebek's mustache went on to play Jason Sudeikis' mustache on Ted Lasso. Remember when Alex shaved it off? It was headline news. Then a few years later, he uh, brought it back. People didn't like it, so he shaved it off again. These were all breaking news. I tell you, I shave almost every day, and I don't get that kind of coverage. Seriously, though, it's quite well known that Jeopardy! was created by one-time talk show host, would-be actor and crooner in his day, media mogul Merv Griffin, famously on a flight from Minnesota to New York in 1964. Merv and his wife, Julian, came up with the answer question concept for a game show. It is said that upon landing in New York, Merv immediately headed to NBC and sold them on the idea. The original daily daytime Jeopardy, some of us may remember those sliding wooden panels revealing the clues, was hosted by Art Fleming. It ran on NBC from 1964 to 1975. A nighttime syndicated version ran weekly from September of 74 to September of 75. From 78 to 79, there was a brief revival, the all-new Jeopardy. It ran nightly. The version we now know began with Alex Trebek behind the podium in 1984. Merv Griffin also created and owned Wheel of Fortune and produced his two game shows under Merv Griffin Productions. He sold that company to Coca-Cola, who at the time owned Columbia Pictures Studios in Hollywood for $250 million. That's $250 million 1986 dollars but he stayed on as executive producer. You may not know Merv also wrote the final Jeopardy theme song, that 30-second ditty. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Yeah, that one. Every time the song played, Merv got paid. Over the years, earning estimates are around $100 million just for that song. Since that time, there have been a number of Hollywood studio takeovers. Jeopardy! is now a production of Sony Picture Studios. But that final credit on each Jeopardy! episode still says, created by Merv Griffin. When Merv Griffin passed in 2007 at age 82, his net worth was set to be $1.3 billion. Not bad for a one-time daytime talk show host. What did you say to you on the last show? I said, so, I said I'm going to say something I've never had the opportunity for 23 years on this show. I will not be right back after this message. Jeopardy! is the number one game show in North America and has about 30 international versions running around the world. Though I have some memories of sick days from school watching the old wooden version of Art Fleming's Jeopardy!, my real love of the show began in the 80s. It was a smart show. 
I fancied myself a smart person. At last, a game show for me. I get the show nightly at 7.30. For a decade, it has been part of my daily PVR and a VCR before that. I record the show and I watch it when I'm done my day, usually around 9 p.m. In the late 80s, I was still with Rogers Media and in Toronto, they owned Channel 47, which ran Jeopardy for a few years. So when Jeopardy did a Toronto talent search, Alex came to town. I met him. It was more like a receiving line, not really to talk to. But I did become friends with the producer and a talent coordinator. We stayed in touch for a couple of years afterward. As an employee of the company that ran Jeopardy, I was ineligible as a potential contestant, but I wanted to be one. So they let me take the written test as it was done in the day. I was really good at Jeopardy nightly on my couch, but this test was hard. Applicants were never given the correct answers or exact test results. Those were kept confidential, you know, so that they could reuse the same test in different markets for a few years. You were told either that you'd passed and qualified for the next level, or that you missed it by one. One night out for dinner with the Jeopardy producers, I said, come on, you can tell me. I know I'm not eligible, but my score, you can tell me. Finally, they relented. They said, okay. You missed it by one. It's always been interesting to me that Jeopardy survived, even flourished off and on, mostly on, for the last 60 years. Because it's a smart show. A smart television show. Television, for most of its history, is known for dumbing down content for a mass audience. Jeopardy never really dumbed it down. Even during the era of game shows. For decades, daytime television was mostly soap operas and game shows. There were the original game show classics. What's my line? To tell the truth, I've got a secret. Name that tune, you bet your life. Beat the clock. And the infamous $64,000 question. In the ensuing years, and I'll bet you've seen most or all of these, let's make a deal, password, the dating game, the newlywed game, love connection, tic-tac-doe, tattletales, battle of the sexes, break the bank, split second, concentration. Alex Trebek actually hosted that one, along with classic concentration. Hollywood Squares, match game, press your luck, supermarket sweep, card sharks, jokers wild, win, lose, or draw. I mean, if you think about it, even Survivor and uh, American Idol were essentially game shows. Remember Pyramid? I love that Pyramid show. Dick Clark, another smart show. They have the daily $25,000 Pyramid and the primetime $100,000 Pyramid. Remember, a celebrity had to describe things to a contestant without using the word. Airplanes, the stock market. Category would be things that crash. Tables, chairs, dancers, things with legs. Anyway, it was a good show. Today, the successful game show stalwarts are what I call the big four. They're not the only four game shows, but they're the most popular and profitable. Jeopardy, Wheel of Fortune, Family Feud, and The Price is Right. Now, I don't even think of The Price is Right as a game show. I mean, I know there are games, technically, but it's really a one-hour-long ad. It's an infomercial with commercials in between the infomercial segments. What a scam. These silly games, you know, arrange the items from least expensive to most expensive. The Arm & Hammer Baking Soda, Windex Glass Cleaner, the new Toyota RAV4. Well, of course, all of these people are paying for their product placement on the show. It is said each Price is Right episode has already turned a profit before it even hits the airwaves with more sold commercials in it. Notable, too, that Jeopardy! Price and Wheel all had hosts that had been with the show for decades, all now replaced. The Feud has had several iterations with several hosts from the original Richard Dawson through, and who remembers these guys, Ray Combs, Richard Garn, John O'Hurley, Louis Anderson, Al Roker, and of course, currently, Steve Harvey. 
Price is Right still runs daily on network TV. That is a rarity. These days, to get a big game show fix, you have to order the Game Show Network. They have a lot of classics that have been remade. They also have some new shows like America Says. That wasn't bad. But, you know, you got to get the Game Show Network. Nah. I mean, how many specialty channels and streaming services can one person afford? I'll pass. David Spade has a show called uh, Snake Oil, where contestants have to try and guess whether a strange product is real or snake oil. Jerry O'Connell, Vern from Stand By Me, hosts Pictionary. I watched that one day, seemed kind of lame. You're trying to guess what people who can't draw are drawing. That's exciting. And of course, today we can get our gaming fix with all these games on our phones. There's even live gambling games. Or you can play the stock market on your phone, which is the best of both the gambling and the game show worlds. The stock market, the biggest casino in the world. So yeah, we're back to the big four, Price, Feud, Wheel, and Jeopardy. Jeopardy is the smartest. Although, again, as we started to get into the 21st century, there was a bit of a game show revival, remember? And every game attempted to dumb down the game show once again to a mass audience. And it went like this. At the top was Jeopardy. Categories from pop culture to opera, history. I mean, you had to know your stuff. But then it started to go down the evolutionary chain. Then we had the weakest link. You still had to know stuff, but there were twice the number of contestants. And all you really had to do was survive around and not be the weakest link. You are the weakest link. Goodbye. Now that's too tough. Shortly thereafter came Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? They dumbed it down with multiple choice. You didn't have to necessarily know the answer. Just pick one of the four. Oh, uh, you know what? That may be tough too. So let's dumb it down a little bit with lifelines. 50-50, where two of the incorrect answers were eliminated. Now it's a coin flip. Or you can phone a friend or ask the audience. That show, you could go 15 minutes watching someone struggling using lifeline after lifeline. Oh, for God's sake, just say an answer. Say Attila the Hun. It's Attila the Hun. Oh, no, no. We're going to break for commercial. And then when we come back, we'll watch this guy sitting here again, thinking it through for another 10 minutes. Who thought that was riveting TV? But trust the uh, showbiz executives, you know, they thought, well, that's going to be too tough for some Americans as well. How about this? Are you smarter than a fifth grader? No, no, that, that still could be too tough. We better dumb it down again. How about this? We get Howie Mandel, 26 out of work Hollywood actresses and models, and contestants have to pick a number. Pick a number. Can you just pick a number between 1 and 26? That's the show. And when you do, one of the 26 women holding a briefcase will reveal a dollar amount inside that briefcase, and then we can negotiate. To me, that was the lowest. A game show where you just pick a number. Think about it. Each show was dumber than the one before it and required less and less gray matter as you went along. And they were all popular, but they didn't survive. You know what survived? Jeopardy. Jeopardy even survived the death of their host, Alex Trebek, in November of 2020. Even as he battled cancer, Alex continued to tape shows and speak out as an advocate of detection and treatment. His last show aired in January of 2021. People thought, could there still be a Jeopardy without Alex? I thought Jeopardy handled the uh, anointing of a new host rather poorly, piss poorly, as my dad would say. First, they announced that the most well-known and successful contestant Jeopardy has ever seen, Ken Jennings, would be the first in a series of guest hosts. These would be auditions, but like right on TV. Remember those weeks? Katie Couric hosted. So did Anderson Cooper, LeVar Burton, Joe Buck, Aaron Rodgers, Dr. Oz. Jesus. Well, no, not Jesus. He had previous commitments. But all of these others and more, I thought this did a terrible disservice to the memory of Alex. It was almost like they were saying, Alex, thanks for 37 seasons of service, but we now think that any one of these people can do what you did. 
Maya Bialik was an early favorite. She was already famous. An actual smart person, a woman. She did a great job hosting. Yet somehow, she didn't get the gig. Neither did uh, LeVar Burton, Katie Couric, or uh, any of those guest hosts. And suddenly, it went to the executive producer of Jeopardy and Wheel, Mike Richards. What? As his first few taped episodes aired, he seemed quite um, competent. Still a strange choice, but uh, okay. But then it came out, you know, some podcast comments surfaced of Richards making disparaging remarks about women and Jews and the disabled. Oops, you're gone. He was gone in like two weeks. And two weeks after that, he was also let go as producer of the shows. One insider tweeted, The witch is dead. Recently, Richards finally spoke out about that uh, entire time in his life. He said his comments were taken out of context. <laughs> That's what they all say. But they really messed this whole thing up. Merv Griffin had to be turning over in his billion-dollar grave. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's the Merv Griffin set. How did you get this in here? Well, you just bring it in sideways and look it. <laughs> so where are you going to sleep? Get backstage. They made the right choice eventually. Ken Jennings, with Mayim Bialik apparently uh, doing specials and fill-ins. Ken does a terrific job. He also does not do something that Alex always did. Alex had a way of making the contestant feel stupid for not responding correctly, no matter how obscure it may have been. Oh no, it is of course Mount Shekimura. All right, Alex, how did I not know that? Sorry. You know all. Ken is not as condescending. Honestly, I was never a fan of Alex. I'm not speaking ill of the dead. I'm just saying I wasn't a fan. I didn't enjoy Jeopardy because of Alex. I enjoyed Jeopardy in spite of Alex. And here's my other problem. What's with these Jeopardy invitational tournaments? Or as I call it, the Tournament of Losers. It's like a second chance tournament. Previous contestants, who may or may not have won a game, are brought back for some reason for this invitational and a chance for a spot in the big tournament of champions. We don't want to see also Rands. It's like the bronze medal game of the World Hockey Championship. No one cares. No one watches. Somehow Jeopardy thought a tournament of losers was valid. It's not. They don't dumb down the actual show, but they do try gimmicky things. Remember the all-star team tournament where they brought back some memorable players? Buzzy Cohen, James Holzhauer, Brad Rutter, of course, Ken. And you notice, too, how less and less we see players on Jeopardy that are memorable? Oh, yeah, there's winners, but not memorable. Come on, talent coordinators. Do your job. And, of course, they have their traditional teachers tournament and then the teens and the college and the celebrity I find them interruptions to the regular game. Sometimes during a regular week, when none of the contestants are doing well, I mumble to myself, oh, I see they finally started uh, Morons Week, and then I laugh. I think now a lot of those theme weeks will run separately from Jeopardy and be hosted by Maya Bialik. And sometimes they have really smart people, and they still don't get any of the correct responses. You know why? The writers are getting too cute. Another question. Why does Jeopardy have to take the month of August off? That is old school TV thinking. Jeopardy in August, those are all reruns. Follow me on the math here. If you are on TV every weeknight all year long, that's five shows per week for 52 weeks. That's 260 shows. Apparently, they can tape about uh, three shows per day. That means in a taping week, a nice Monday through Friday week, you can tape 15 shows. Therefore, you should be able to tape 260 shows, you know, a whole year's worth, in about 18 weeks. 18 weeks. Let's say some of the taping days don't go that well. There's an equipment failure, a key staffer is out sick, there's a power outage. So let's say it takes 20 weeks, 22. Let, let's go 26 weeks. A half a year. Half a year to tape a year's worth of shows, and yet for some reason you need to take August off? Why do you air reruns? I mean, it's not like I remember the shows and already know the answers. I, I don't retain them, but still, why reruns? 
It's 2024. People demand new and original content. Jeopardy has this tried and true formula that has worked for them for 40 years plus, and they're messing with it? Slowly, they are losing me. It's not because of Ken, the new host. I, I told you I like him. It's all of this behind the scenes bungling. Speaking of math, each show has 60 different Jeopardy clues. Jeopardy and Double Jeopardy, 260 shows per year. That's if they didn't do reruns. That would be 15,600 Jeopardy clues in one year, plus 260 final Jeopardies. It's estimated that in the so-called modern Jeopardy era, they've aired about 9,000 episodes. I hope that they're not suddenly getting clueless. Although, at almost 16,000 clues a year for 40 years, maybe that's why some of the clues are impossible to understand. Not even the smart people on TV are buzzing in. I also figured out one day why I think that I am so good at playing Jeopardy. When I am watching Jeopardy on the couch, and I know the correct answer, I shout it out, and I give myself full points. If I know the answer, but just can't come up with it right at that time, and the contestant says it, and I recognize it as being correct, I give myself full points. If I recognize the clue as something I should know, or used to know once, but can't really get it at the time, I give myself full points. Sometimes if it's a category I hate, like opera, I say that no one could possibly know that, and uh, I get myself full points. And every once in a while, I don't even understand the clue. What do you want, the place, or the person, or the year? What are you saying? I say that's their fault. I give myself half points. Final Jeopardy, I always bet it all. So at the end of the show, I'm either Jeopardy champion once again, or I missed it by one. Later That Same Life is written, voiced, and produced by Larry Fedorik. LarryFedorik37 at gmail.com. Subscribe to Larry's podcast YouTube channel. Get automatic notifications with each new episode. 